Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today, we're gonna to take a look at the rural areas in the United States and many areas of the world and see what trends are out there and how they're being affected and what can be done to help develop rural leadership. My guest today is an expert in this area. Mr. Don Mackey is the leader of Entrepreneurial Ecosystems, formerly called the Center for Rural Entrepreneurship, which was a new initiative with the Network Kansas. Don Mackey, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Hey, Bill, I'm delighted and honored to be with you. Looking forward to our conversation today. I am too, and so good to see you. I'm just, uh, let's start off right at the very beginning, Don. Let's just start off with uh, the E2 Entrepreneurial Ecosystem. What is that operation and how does it tie into the uh, Kansas, the Network Kansas program? So, uh, an entrepreneurial ecosystem is the environment in which uh, entrepreneurs operate and, and communities and regions create those environments with capital and technical assistance and uh, the kind of culture that's supportive of entrepreneurship. And over the years, I've been working in community economic development for over 40 years. We've come to believe that uh, growing a stronger economy, a stronger society by fostering entrepreneurial talent is the way to go. And the ecosystem is the environment in which uh, they find the things they need to be successful and in turn help grow more successful communities. Uh, with respect to Network Kansas, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, Network Kansas offered to provide uh, uh, entrepreneurial ecosystems or E2 for short, uh, uh, a home. And uh, But in their own right, they are probably the longest running and most robust rural entrepreneurial ecosystem in the United States. It, that, that sounds very impressive. That, that sounds like a great operation. Now, when we're talking about rural areas, and of course, I know you've worked all over North America, but it, I, I'm sure that there are variations in rural areas, but what are some of the general trends you see? I, I could throw out some ideas that I've gleaned from just my readings, limited readings over the years, but what are some of the trends that you see as far as healthcare services, uh, opioid crisis, climate change, and then we'll get into them in greater detail as we go through, through the program. Yeah, it, I mean, to your point, uh, North America, rural North America is very diverse. I mean, if you think about timber country in the Northwest, uh, my part of the country, which is commodity agriculture, uh, a very diverse set of landscapes. And so each of those are unique. But I think the common uh, trend that has been most impactful is uh, the transformation that has occurred as single industries that kind of carried these rural areas, whether that's textiles in the Carolinas um, uh, or mining in the Rocky Mountain West, those industries have changed. Uh, they've either automated or they've offshored and that's created economic crashes in many of these communities. And as a result of losing those single industries and not having the kind of economic diversity to weather them, that's led to a whole set of issues. Uh, the ability for those communities to support health care and, and acquire broadband, which are both essential services, uh, but it's also led to at-risk behavior ranging from substance abuse, uh, which oftentimes then leads to increased incarceration, uh, declines in labor force participation, but it also is a contributing factor to the radicalization that's occurring in certain parts of rural America, uh, where people feel marginalized and they're embracing um, uh, activities that, uh, um, you know, are, are a real challenge for their communities. And this is a, this is so important. And, and of course, a lot of rural areas, uh, not so many, maybe not as many urban areas or depend upon those primary industries and it'd be at one company or one plant or uh, coal or whatever it might, timber or whatever. And when that, when that disappears or there's a lesser, uh, the demand lessens, it's just absolutely disastrous. Sounds like there's going to be a rural transformation. Are you involved in a rural transformation to help train rural leaders to deal with this? and to share ideas with them, best practices, and that type of thing? 
that's the whole point of our work is uh, how do you, number one, grow uh, a stronger economy that's more diversified so that you're not at risk uh, to that single industry, that single plant that kind of sustains your community. And, and again, we believe that entrepreneurship uh, by fostering people, uh, pursuing their own dreams, creating ventures, some of those are gonna reach markets outside of the community. You just create a much uh, more uh, broad economy that has the ability to weather uh, some of the macro changes. And so if you lose a business, there's other businesses that are thriving and, and the community's kind of able to avoid that uh, boom and bust cycle that's so common with single industry communities. And so over the years, uh, we have developed a, a development framework that's widely used in different parts of North America to help communities uh, find that entrepreneurial talent, develop it, and in turn, uh, grow a more diverse economy. And when you do that, you then have the resources to address these other issues. You have less substance abuse. You can uh, maybe stem the tide of uh, uh, out migration, which is a huge issue for certain parts of the country, or that chronic and severe poverty that is the outcome of failed economies in other parts of rural America. Mm -hmm. In so many communities in the past, it seems like, as uh, I've read, they, they relied more on high volume as opposed to high value industries or businesses or farms or whatever the case might be. Uh, do you find that that is still the case or is that changing a bit? I guess when you're moved from a, from a primary industry into a, a more of a, a, a multi type of arrangement that, that's going to change. But do you see that changing? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because it's it's a huge issue and it's not just a rural issue. It's also important to urban America. But uh, another way to think about it is, is that high volume economy is really tied into uh, scale and uh, 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 certain commodities. Uh, and so if we think about corn producers in Nebraska, they're producing a commodity that's global. They're price takers. When the price goes down, there's not much they can do. Uh, and that creates a real stress on their own operations, but in an entire regional economy. And by moving away, you know, that part of the economy is going to be there. But by diversifying that economy, uh, and really finding competitive niches, higher value activities, uh, more diverse activities, uh, you can begin to grow a much more resilient economy um, that has the ability to uh, persevere during really bad times and, and come out the other end uh, and thrive. And that becomes really important because we're in this very dynamic environment where we need systems that can respond quickly to the changes that are coming, whether that's from climate change or global competition. A few years ago, the United States and China got into a sort of a tariff tax war with each other. And of course, the Chinese have been large purchasers of soybeans and other commodities like that from, from American farmers, mostly not from Brazilian or Argentinian farmers. But that market basically almost disappeared overnight. But how did you deal? First of all, you may not have even dealt with that. But if you did, how did these farmers adapt to this? I know the Chinese went to Brazil, they went to Argentina, and to other producers, agricultural producers, to fill that void. But how, how did you? Well, first off, did you deal with it? If you did, how did how did the farmers turn this around a bit and work into some other type of uh, revenue producing activity? Well, we did deal with it. Uh, you know, in my home state of Nebraska, uh, Nebraska Farm Bureau did some studies. Uh, uh, farm income dropped by billions um, because we export a lot of what we produce. Um, and that really took us from some of the best times in agriculture, coinciding with the Great uh, Recession, where we were kind of counter cyclical to uh, you know, a, a major contraction and then a very deep recession. And so right now, if you look at uh, uh, commodity agriculture in the heartland of America, if it weren't for federal subsidies, um, we would be seeing 
bankruptcies and failures and in past years when we've had ag, ag crisis, you know, higher rates of suicide and substance abuse, you know, the things that happen when people are under very severe uh, distress. And so they're hanging on um, and the federal subsidies have kept the system afloat. Uh, but at some point, unless we can get the, uh, uh, you know, those markets back, uh, the trade wars have just been hugely damaging uh, to commodity agriculture whether that's cotton, rice, or, you know, uh, corn and, and soybeans in our part of the country. Mm -hmm. Very few, it's, as is often said by economists, very few people win trade wars. The best way is to negotiate your way through them and to try to make changes. But the trade wars just do not work. I know when this happened about three or four years ago, we were subsidizing farmers in Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, Kentucky, to the tune of thirteen billion dollars, and now I think it's up to thirty-six billion. Or yeah, so it's it, it, oh, it's gone up uh, tripled over the last couple of years. Yeah, and it's unsustainable. The country's okay. not going to continue to support commodity agriculture at those levels because there's other competing interests. Um, uh, the political power of the farm built is is a minority, and every ten years that minority gets a little bit smaller as population shifts. Uh, and so that's why it's, it, it's so important that uh, rural communities, uh, we always say diversify within agriculture. Um, so, you know, how do you get into value added activities? And then how do you diversify beyond agriculture? Because that's the key. And, and the same is true in other single industries, whether that's fishing on the East Coast or timber in the West, uh, you know, mining in the Southwest. Um, uh, you, you really have to, if you're gonna be a community that's gonna have a long, bright future, um, undertake uh, entrepreneurship so that um, you're not solely dependent upon that industry that is so likely to boom and bust. And, uh, you know, even if we can get back to good trade, there's still those those deep cycles that can be so damaging to the vitality of a community. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guests. We'd invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with a PBS or community access television station, or perhaps an educational institution that has an intra campus television hookup, or you just have a computer, you have a website, you like our shows and you'd like to share them, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided at no cost as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today, we're taking a look at the rural areas and some of the major challenges confronting them, not only in the United States, but really probably in uh, most rural areas all around the world. My guest today is an expert on this topic. Don Mackey is the leader of the E2 Entrepreneurial Ecosystems, formerly the Center for Rural Entrepreneurship, which was a new initiative with Network Kansas. Don, we're talking about the rural areas and unique challenges, and every area has a challenge, obviously. Urban areas certainly do, rural areas do. Are there certain factors that exist in the rural areas that you don't see in, in larger communities that are endemic or unique to them? Well, I think part of it is scale. Um, based on our experience, uh, rural communities, uh, individuals, small groups of leaders still have a, a great potential to exercise change. Um, and we see that uh, in some of our case studies of very successful rural communities that if you will, are beating the trends that are thriving. And uh, so that opportunity to really make a difference and, We've worked with those communities to learn uh, what are they doing uh, that other communities aren't that are allowing them to be successful. That's foundational to our work. Uh, I think the other thing, though, is rural communities increasingly have to recognize that, number one, they're part of a larger region that is probably anchored by a metropolitan area. And uh, there are strong economic and social connections, just as you were talking about international 
uh, relations and trade, we're a very interconnected world the, the, these days. And so um, the old days of Norman Rockwell and you know the isolated rural community that was kind of self-sufficient is long gone. And so understanding those interconnections, which represent opportunities to develop stronger economies and stronger communities becomes important. I think one of the major uh, challenges, but it's also an opportunity, is for rural America to really embrace diversity of human talent. Uh, America continues to become much more uh, diverse. Uh, you know, our country was really built on waves of uh, folks of different colors and backgrounds and religions and orientations who uh, have come to America to seek opportunity. And uh, we're seeing that happen now uh, in, in rural America as, as uh, uh, whether it's 30 year olds or retiring boomers that are moving into rural areas uh, to get away from congestion, to maybe take that real estate that they had in an urban place and parlay that into a rural place and uh, generate some cash for retirement. These are huge opportunities for rural America but it requires that um, we embrace diversity as an asset, not as a threat. Um, and that's probably one of the biggest differences uh, in addition to just sheer size and scale is um, rural America continues to be pretty homogeneous and uh, is facing the need to really embrace diversity um, as part of the, the game plan for uh, um, development success. And we've uh, talked today about some of the items or some of the, I guess, the, the developmental issues or developmental um, resources available to folks in the rural area. And you mentioned broadband earlier. I mentioned the lack of health care. So often rural areas don't have hospitals they don't, or maybe don't have direct access to high level health service deliverers or something like that. But when you're looking at the people with whom you work, what are some of the what are some of the attributes, characteristics, skills of folks that you find that you go out to work with who are very successful or more successful at helping to tr make that transition? I won't say reform, but to really do a transition of that rural economy. Well, I think one of the uh, uh, lessons we've learned, and this really kind of comes out of uh, leadership programs in production agriculture that has allowed producers and others in the agricultural sector to travel the world, um, go on those trade missions, um, uh, those trips to learn about other parts of the country and other parts of the world. Uh, that global view is so critically important um, because number one, it helps people understand that we, we are truly part of a, a, an international economy and society. Um, and we have to figure out how we can be successful within the context of that environment. I think the second is the recognition that uh, um, uh, we can be very successful in rural America. I mean, there are remarkable businesses. Uh, before the pandemic, I was visiting a, a feedlot that is probably one of the most sophisticated uh, cutting edge feedlots in the whole world. Uh, the technology they're using is amazing. They consult all over the world on how to operate a highly efficient uh, animal friendly um, feedlot. And uh, it's world class and they know they're world class, but they're in this rural setting. Um, uh, but they recognize that there can be this excellence. And, and I think that's an important attribute. We see that particularly in uh, places like Minnesota and parts of the Dakotas where there are strong international connections and folks really understand that they can be as globally competitive as anyone else and uh, they're doing the right things to learn how to do that. Uh, and it changes uh, the success of the communities in which they are involved. Mm -hmm. It certainly does. And of course, being in that area of the country, they're right around Canada, which is our number one trading partner. So right. that certainly helps. And it, uh, it can certainly be a win-win situation for everybody concerned. Well, we often hear the term, a great reset. Do you use that term? In, in your line of business, or do we see a great reset taking place 
in a large number of the rural communities around the U.S., Canada, and, and other parts of the world, too. I mean, it's not just here. There, a lot of folks are dealing with these issues and these problems. Yeah, absolutely. I, I got introduced to the term in 2010 as we were just coming out of the Great Recession. Um, uh, uh, Richard Florida, uh, the author of the Creative Class books, had published a book, uh, The Great Reset. Um, and it, it really was informative to me. And part of what Florida and his research team did is they looked at the fundamental change that occurred following the long depression after the Civil War and the Great Depression of the 1930s. And they put forward this idea, which I think is very valid, that when you have these kind of very difficult events, um, and the pandemic recession will be one of those, uh, it upsets the status quo. I mean, will we ever go back to working in large commercial buildings again the way we did before the pandemic? Um, I know here in my hometown of Lincoln, uh, State Farm Insurance has said, we will not reopen our, our uh, facility here. Those hundreds and hundreds of workers are going to work from home and we're gonna change the way we, uh, we work uh, post pandemic. And so the reset, I think, is really important. And in our work, we are tracking a set of trends that we think are accelerating as part of the pandemic recession uh, that are going to fundamentally change the opportunities that we have uh, as we move forward. Um, and uh, uh, this event is one of those that, uh, you know, when we all get old, we'll go, I remember what I did during the pandemic. And the fact that people are, and some people can do this, even now we see that so many companies are having their employees, as you mentioned, work from home. And of course, that seems like it would be a boon, or it could be a, certainly a selling point for someone who wanted to live in a rural area, work for a large corporation that may be operating in New York City or wherever you're in Lincoln, Nebraska, or it could be some other place. But it seems like that uh, would help to pave the way if you could do that well into the future. Absolutely. There, there's really two uh, trends at work. One is um, that remote work. Um, and part of it is employers getting comfortable uh, working with folks that aren't, you know, somebody that they can drop by their office and, and talk to. The, it, it takes employers a, a little bit of adaptation to get used, and, used to and comfortable with working with employees or contractors that way. Um, the pandemic recession has really accelerated that. And, and so that's one of the trends. The other is outsourcing. And, and this, again, with all of these great reset kind of trends, their work, they simply get accelerated, at least in our experience, during an event like the pandemic recession. And so large uh, employers, whether it's the federal government, the Defense Department, or large corporations, they have been outsourcing as a way to keep their overhead low, uh, create more flexible workforces. And while some of that outsourcing has to be close to where they have a production facility or a headquarters, a lot of it means that, uh, just to your point, uh, that person may be doing technical work uh, for a company in New York City, um, but they're living on the old farmstead in the eastern plains of Colorado. And as long as they've got good broadband and access to a commercial airport, maybe a little longer drive, but you know, miles and minutes are different in rural America than they are in or in urban places, uh, they can be uh, successful. And uh, we think that that's going to dramatically accelerate. And that means huge opportunities for rural America where folks go, um, gosh, I can live in this community at a fraction of the cost but still have a job with a major employer in Chicago or Atlanta or LA. Um, and again, that kind of employment also brings diversity to the economy because those folks are working in areas that are not necessarily dependent upon agriculture, or whatever the underlying natural resource industry that has been driving that community. So these are hugely important uh, opportunities. They certainly are. And if it may be a boon for a lot of people living in rural areas. Now, this may not work out as well for the people who have who are renting buildings in New York City or wherever the case might be. Things may be a little rougher in the future for them. But 
But again, you're right. It is. It may, it's a world of difference when you live in an area that, especially if you're nearby, an urban area that has the cultural amenities, but you don't have the air pollution. You don't have your traffic jams last two minutes instead of two hours or something right. like that. And it, it does. It makes a world of difference. Well, Don, this is a very important area. Let me ask you just briefly in closing, what do you see as the major challenge as you move forward in helping people to better understand that they can convert, they can make they can make that transformation in their rural area and make it a much more productive, uh, more livable, more desirable place to be? Well, I, th I think the biggest challenge is recognizing uh, what is the development formula for moving forward? Uh, uh, don't mean this critically, but too many states, uh, too many communities are still locked into uh, the development strategy that worked well, uh, World War II and after World War II of let's go out and attract an industry. Uh, let's double down on that uh, natural resource industry we have and simply not embracing entrepreneurship as a way to move forward. And uh, so I think that's the greatest challenge is uh, for communities to step back and say, just because this strategy was good for us for the last 30 years doesn't mean it's the right strategy for moving forward. And uh, taking the time to look around at what communities are thriving, that's exactly what we did almost 30 years ago is we went to places in rural America that were doing better. And what we found is they had, for whatever reason, embraced uh, supporting entrepreneurial development as a way to move forward. And that was growing better economies. And so um, making that pivot uh, and embracing uh, these new opportunities is huge. Uh, and there's great models out there of communities and regions that, have, that are doing this and are, are making progress. Um, uh, but we have to, um, you know, loosen our grip on how we used to do things and embrace where the true opportunities are moving forward into this part of the century. Well, Don Mackey, we're certainly going to have to make transformational changes as opposed to incremental changes, because that's the society we're living in, whether we like it or not. It, it doesn't matter one way or the other. But I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Hey, it's been my pleasure uh, anytime. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to share our views with your audience and best to you in 2021. Thank you, Don. Stay safe. Always. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.